All right, welcome back to an all new episode of Marina's Morning Skates. We are officially quarter way through the NHL season. I have my pal Ty Anderson here with me to break down everything going on with the Boston Bruins. Ty, how are you doing? What's going on? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm about as good as I can be, I guess, <laughs> right? With all the chaos happening around us. So I'll take it. Um, I got a chance to see Ty. Well, I think like maybe two weeks ago, I made him come down and say hello to me. So we had a nice little reunion and told me all about how crazy trains the best song in the world. Wow. Should have got that. Yeah, no, I called the cops on you for putting that on Twitter, <laughs> saying that I said that I I would I would never I would literally never say that ever in a million years. <laughs> now with Twitter, did you see like Twitter's new policy now where you can't like share private media? What do you mean? Like. Like, like I that, think it's like I think like it's that like, photo of me would classify as private media. I think so. I think it's like uh, no, I don't want that on the internet. Like you could. That's weird. I do like it for getting rid of the idea that like you can send a photo of someone back at that person as like a chirp because I don't really like that. It's like, hey man, we're all ugly. There's like ten good looking people in the world. Like <laughs> someone doesn't even know they're ugly. The only time I find it acceptable is when someone who is ugly is calling someone else ugly. Cause that, cause it's like you said, we're all ugly. So it's like, you can't yeah. use stones if you were ugly. I guess so. I guess that, that, that checks out that tracks. Mm-hmm. You can do that. I guess. I, but... I don't really, I don't usually go that route anyways. I, I never get in the mud just because it's like, I'm not going to give you the time of day. Yeah. I have a, I have a very hard time at, at, in the year 2021, actually engaging in arguments on the internet. It just doesn't really seem to make much sense for anybody um we're gonna get into Tuka Rask later but I can only imagine the takes that are gonna fly when he returns I mean it, it's kind of crazy that they're gonna fly because when he does come back he's not gonna be on the contract that everyone hated he's not like like the expectations are not gonna be I don't think they should be anyways what they were previously not like you've had great goaltending right now honestly so it's gonna be weird when that all happens like <laughs> the argument should shift but it won't we'll talk about that later let's get into last night's game against the national predators bees a nice rebound game after dud against detroit uh jeremy swayman 42 saves i think it, i think it was a nice rebound game from him um especially with sweeney you know saying that the goalies have just been okay um, so far this season, Jake DeBrusque, which we will touch in earlier with the game winning goal. Just what'd you see from them last night that was different than the game against Detroit? Yeah, I mean, this felt like a game where it was a 60 minute effort for the most part, where not a lot of lulls like, yeah, they had they, they encountered a second period push from Nashville. I think at one point Nashville, I think had like nine of the first 11 shots of the second periods. But you expect that right They're down to nothing. Brandon Carlos scores 30 seconds in. Okay, now they have to be desperate and push here. But I thought it was a complete effort. And I think what I liked most about it was that it was probably their first good win of the season, right? And and, that, and that's something they've needed. Like they beat Florida in a shootout back in Boston. But look at the context, right? Florida was in the second leg of a back-to-back. Spencer Knight was in goal. And it went to a shootout. Like they needed a, a good quality win. And I think last night they got it. Yeah, and... I will say it was good for Swayman. He didn't get the the last couple starts. So it, it was good for them to kind of go in that direction. And I think it started with him. But like you said, you know, when you see that they the Bruins allowed 42 shots on goal, you think, oh, like they maybe they didn't play as well. But I think it was just like they were up to nothing early. So it's like obviously Nashville was going to come back at them. Um, I thought it was jarring and I was ready to throw hands about how much they fucking – when after Patrice Bergeron last night, I know Brad Marchand was probably pissed, like watching the game on his couch, like just furious that no one was doing anything about it. And I was just like, and I know Bergeron's a guy who's like, I don't, I'm sure he'd want to handle it himself, but I thought it was kind of weird, that kind of lack of response. Yeah, I think timing may have been everything with that, right? Like it's it's the third period referencing the cousin incidents the cousin incident more than the Forsberg one but I think that maybe they looked at the time of game and said okay we can't afford to make, take a, a four minute penalty here or something but I'm with you that if it's Bergeron and and you are so depleted right now right like Providence is in lockdown um you don't have any healthy uh skaters really as a healthy scratch right now especially after losing Zaboro it's like Bergeron's playing hurt right now too I think to some degree so 
you can't let people touch him. Like you can't let people get away with taking liberties on him. So yeah, I wanted somebody to come in there, you know, whether it's Felino or Frederick Forbert, um, just McAvoy. We've seen him do literally it anybody, oh, just anybody. You got to do something. You can't let somebody pick on your captain, basically, especially someone like Nick cousins, who is not someone I want picking on priest Bergeron, you know, no, no offense to the cousins family or to Nick himself, but that's not a guy that you want thinking he can mess with a guy like priest Bergeron. And it's funny because I'm not like a grit person. I'm like, I'm not like, Oh, this team needs more sandpaper. Like they did in the 80. Like I'm like, not that person, but I just found myself so furious. Like he was bleeding and his nose looked all fucked up. But I was just like, man, get this man some help. I know. I, I, I want to hear what Martian has to say about that because like, I know he's probably pissed. He had yeah, to be so mad. That's why teams are doing it though. I think yeah. because they're like, okay, they don't have like their, the motor here. Who's going to come in and smack me upside the head. And, and this is where it gets interesting, right? Because now Marshan's a repeat offender, right? So if that does happen in a game and he tries to settle a score, tries to make things even, does he get in more trouble now, right? So, well, I'm sure we'll get to that, but but that's all part of it too, where it's just like, you know, I'm with you that I'm not one of these guys who pounds the table and says they need more toughness, but because I do think they have the right amount of 2021 toughness, you know, like they don't have Ryan Reese, but they have guys who will throw hits and will throw hands when necessary. But I wanted something more there. I think at that situation, you got to send that message that you can't mess with Bergeron. Right. And so didn't see it, but these teams meet again in about a month now. So maybe we'll see it then. Right. Um, you brought it up earlier, but the Jacob Zaboral, pretty brutal injury. We still don't know the extent of it, but it didn't look good. He needed help getting off the ice. Wasn't putting any weight on that right leg. Brutal, 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 brutal timing for him. I mean, he was playing so well as of late and it was kind of like, finally, man, like he's finally being consistent. Finally, like what we wanted to see from him after all these years. And it's just the worst possible timing for him to go down. Yeah, it sucks. I mean, it's it's reminiscent of Zach Senishin a couple of years ago, right? Where he was finally looking like he was fitting on that third line with Coil, and he has a, I believe it was a knee injury, and it sets him back. And we haven't really seen him since. And we have, it's been for eight minutes a night, basically. So it's it's bad timing for him. It's bad timing for the Bruins, right? Because they still don't have any sort of solidified defensive pairings in terms of what they want to do and what they will do. Uh, but that Riley Zaboral pairing was looking good, was looking promising. And having those guys, you know, connected and it being a pairing, I think was allowing the Bruins to look at their other options and say, okay, we got, we got to figure out two pairings now versus three. Right. So now you, you may be back in that situation of trying to figure out three pairings here. So we'll see. I mean, Clifton though, he's a, he's a guy who, if he does have to step in tomorrow night, which I think we're in agreement that, I it's probably unlikely to see Zaboral out there tomorrow, just the optics of his injury. Um, but Clifton's a guy who, when he sits for long stretches and comes back in, you know, he plays with his, with his head on fire. So that might be a good thing, honestly, but consistency will be the big test for him as well. Cliffy hockey, a little bit chaotic, but maybe that's something that they need right now. Um, I just wanted to point out the stat goalies with 42 more saves in a shutout. Bill Ranford did it three times. Tim Thomas did it twice. Old pal Jonas Gustafson did it once. And Jeremy Swayman is now on the board. I would just like to know, I wonder what Jonas Gustafson is up to. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, did he have another NHL chance after the Bruins? Was he with like the Oilers? I want to say he's with the Oilers. I want to say, yeah, out West. I think he did a year, maybe two years. He had that horrible, horrible ending to his Bruins career. He was in net for that Ottawa game, that mm-hmm. six to one, whatever it was, loss where they all you had to do was win and you were in and and they lost. And that's that's the that's the game. That's that's the game. But you know what though? That might be a blessing in disguise. If you see, <laughs> if you ever see Jonas Gustafson out there, thank him because he helped you get Charlie McAvoy. So <laughs> he can't forget about that one. <laughs> thank you for your service. Yeah, you went to Edmonton for a year. Uh only played seven games and those and went back to the AHL. He's now playing in the Swedish league. He's but still yeah. playing. Yeah. Wow. That actually surprised me. Oh wait, me. no, no, no. That was two years ago. Oh, okay. So he was pretty old, but yeah, I thought that was quite a stat. It's we'll get into the goalie discussion later, but I just wanted to bring up that stat. Uh, we alluded to it earlier, but Marsh answered the second game of his three game suspension. I called in real time. I was on Evan Marinowski's podcast when the, when the news came through and I was like, this is such bullshit. Like if his name isn't Brad Marsh and he's not getting three games, especially when PK Subban gotten absolutely nothing. 
some fun. Yeah, it's it's really annoying. I like because I think that I think that if it were one game, we'd be like, okay, right. whatever. I think three is way too much, especially because now, again, like next incident, you can't do three again. It has to be it has more. to be something more, probably, right? That that's how these things tend to go. So I just I just think it's excessive. Um, I thought I think that Martian, you know, I asked him about it this week about the frustration of now being a repeat offender again. And he said, yeah, it's been 310 plus games since my last incident. And, and he said that, that apparently didn't count for anything. And that's annoying because, you know, I, I do think that you're allowed to, I don't know, guys can change, right? Like I know he's 33 years old. He's, you know, he has the reputation that he, that he had right or wrong, but he has made an effort to change. You know, he hasn't been the typical Martian, you know, dirty slew footing spearing we haven't seen a lot of that recently we, what we've actually seen is one of the league's best forwards you know behind Connor mcdavid and leon dreisaitl but apparently it doesn't count for anything which is, which is what really bothers me because guys should be allowed to change if they can prove that they have over time and i thought that he did right and i i, I ultimately went into like conspiracy theory i thought it had more to do with all the Panarin bullshit and what happened there. It just, it just, it's not even about Martian anymore. It's just the, it's just the inconsistencies with the the player, the, the, the department of player safety. Like, I can't believe that this is still a conversation about how inconsistent they are. Like it, it, I don't, it's something that I don't think will ever change. And it just goes to show like how stupid, stupid, stupid it is. But yeah, like you said, it's gotta be super frustrating for him because he has changed. I mean, like he's probably going to be on the, the Olympic team for team Canada should they go to the Olympics next year. So it, 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 it really sucks. It couldn't have come in a worse spot. He's been your MVP this year. So I know he's going to come out with a B under his bonnet when he comes back after the lightning game. So it's just, it's frustrating for a player that good to still have that reputation, especially on a play that there wasn't much going on. Like it wasn't called a penalty on the ice. Like I had to search for it. There were no replays of it. So that that's kind of what drove me crazy. Well, yeah. And the other part of it too is like, so Martian said that they considered his history when giving out the suspension. Why did they consider Tom Wilson's history last year when, when Wilson was suspended and then not suspended, he was suspended for the Brandon Carlo hit, but not suspended for Panarin. They, they referenced that he, Oh, well, the repeat offender status had expired. What, but why not for Martian then? Like, it, what, like what's the difference? Right. And so that's to your point of the inconsistency. Uh, it really does vary player to player. So yeah, that conspiracy theory of, of, oh, it's, you know, for what happened with Panarin, like they want to send a message. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it does have some merit because how can one guy, you not, you don't factor his history and another guy you do. I just think, you know, it's, it's a, Brad Marchand plays hard. Right. And part of that is he has to, because of his size. And I look at what happened with Ekman Larson. I didn't see anything in real time that made me go, oh, that's a dirty play. Didn't even notice it, honestly. I what I see is a five foot nine guy trying to get leverage on a six foot three, a six foot four defenseman. You know, I, I just think ultimately, if you walk away from that game, saying okay, Marshan did this, but Subban ended the guy's season and it's just a fine, and we're calling it a dangerous trip. It's like we're really getting into the game of splitting hairs here and, and picking on guys. It feels like, and you know, I, I guess I'm I'm coming across pro Marshan because I don't think that this was malicious. I don't think this was nearly what I would consider a three game suspension based on what else I've seen this season. It's just, it's just a really weird situation. I think it, it drives me crazy. Like you said, and it's just like, Oh, uh, he, that could in itself be an entire podcast episode about how like inept the department of player safety is, but Marshall, yeah, you know, I mean, say what you say, what you will about like who was in, who was in charge previously at least you had some idea as to where it was going to go. This one, you have no idea. You, you, you have less of an idea with George Peros running player safety than ever before. I, <laughs> it, it, you just, you always spun a wheel, but now you're, you're, you're truly spinning it. Like I have, I have no way what this is going to be. All right, let's get into Jake DeBrusque. The game winning goal last night upped his trade value because he requested a trade. 
Um, I actually think this stems back from the summer. I believe I heard some rumblings that he requested a trade in the summer prior to him and Bruce Cassidy chatting. And then I believe um, that they were going to try and make it work. And then obviously it, it's not working out to say the least. So I just wanted to pick your brain about possible trade destinations. I know it's been reported, you know, maybe 12, more than 12 teams. I think Darren Dreger said that are interested in DeBrusque. Um, I just go back to like hindsight is 2020, but if, if we knew that this was the outcome, right? If we knew that this is what was going to happen, the end of Jake DeBrusque, 10 years, Boston Bruin, you almost wish you flipped him prior right you almost wish you flipped him either in the summer or when they needed someone better last year heading into the playoffs so that's kind of where my frustration is I really thought especially in preseason like he looked like he was going to be a completely different player the player we saw you know in 2018 2019 so I just wanted to pick your brain about the Jake DeBrus trade requests where you think he might go and just the whole situation yeah I mean it was definitely yeah it's painful to think about what could have been right like This was a guy that the Bruins weren't willing to include in a trade for Ryan McDonough in 2018. And fast forward, now the Bruins need defense, right? They need a a high-end defenseman. It's like, well, that would have been a good one if you you could have got him. Uh, And then you go back to even last year, a year and a half ago. You could have used him to, again, address address your top four defense needs after losing Chara and Krug. And then this summer, you could have used him probably as part of a bigger package, I know, uh, to get a, to get some center help, right? None of these things happen. And now you're at it saying, okay, he has four goals. Confidence hasn't looked like what it's been like. He's trending downward yet again. What can you get for him? So I think with some destinations, I think a team out West makes the most sense. I don't think the Bruins necessarily want to play him regularly. Uh, and I don't think that any of the teams that are in the East that we've heard make sense. Uh, just off the top of my head here, we've heard the Rangers, right? The Rangers aren't going to give you anything you want, I don't think. Like, Ryan Strom is a part of their team. As good as he would be to get for the Bruins, the Rangers are pretty good right now. I don't see them bailing on a guy who's who has such a connection with our Timmy Panarin, even if he doesn't have a contract for next year, right? Montreal has nothing I would want if I'm if I'm the Bruins. Uh, unless Tyler Toffoli is on the market and you want to bring that. But, but Toffoli's contract is great. I don't know why anyone would want to move that. And then Buffalo, I don't really think it has anything either. So, you know, that's the, the Eastern teams don't make a lot of sense. So I come back to Vancouver, Arizona. Um, I could even see a team like Seattle. Honestly, they need some offensive help, but it's just about that return, right? Like, like, what do you want in a, in a return for Jake DeBrusque? See, that's so hard because it's like every year we talk about the defense and every year, every year we talk about uh, scoring the lack of, you almost need a player like Jake DeBrusque, like, like a player who is going to, you know, bring the speed, bring the goals and the points and whatever. But I look at this team and I'm like, damn, they need some setter help. Like Charlie Coyle is a great player, but he is not the answer at 2C. So I think ultimately if you can package him and whatever else, to try and get some center help, whether it's like Tomas Hurdle or Sean Monahan or just someone, I think, to help bridge that gap right now um, is probably my priority. But I always go back to defense. I don't think you can have enough um, defenders, especially this year. Um, Forbort has looked a, better, a little bit better as of late, but DeBrus' trade value is so low. And especially when you know a player wants out, it's not going to fucking help you. Like no teams are going to be like, yeah, well, here we go. We'll give you all this stuff for this guy that no longer wants to be a part of your team. So it's tough. It's, it's really hard. And I think Sweeney's going to think long and hard about it and, you know, do his due diligence that way. Yeah. It's funny you say Monahan because that's, that's where my brain went. I think it makes the most sense for both teams. Calgary, Calgary needs to clear some cap space ultimately for next year. Uh, Gaudreau is a UFA and, and Kachuk and uh, Mangiapane are, uh, <laughs> is a, they're both RFAs. So they need new contracts. So if they could get out from Monahan's contract, I think it wouldn't make a big difference to their roster complexion. Ultimately, you look at the way that he's been utilized under Daryl Sutter. I think right now he's averaging career low in time on ice per game. They also have Dylan Doobie, who they could move to center. He's playing the wing right now, but he's he can play center. So you could theoretically have a third line that's DeBrusque, Dubé, and, and then, you know, who else you want to put there. But 
I think Monaghan makes sense, right? And I and I I watch him, and I wonder if he could get his game back to life here if he were playing with a guy like Taylor Hall, right? If that would really help bring out his game, it's a risk, right? Six million for the next two years is a risk. There's no doubt about it. But the Bruins, but you know, you know, Sweeney loves those deals, right? You know, he doesn't exactly. Want, he doesn't want those expiring UFAs, RFAs, whatever it is. So I'm kind of like, you know what? Yeah. And the other part too, is that like, who is, if you pick up Monaghan, who is he roadblocking, right? Like you can say Sadnika, but they haven't used Sadnika in a, in a second line role all season. And the times they have, they quit it mid game both times. So I don't think he's blocking him to be honest with you. So I I think this is a risk the Bruins could afford to make. And it's one they may have to, I I think he's a great option, but if they're looking for an outright DeBrusque replacement, Lawson Krause out in out in Anaheim. He's had a, he's a, I mean I'm sorry Arizona has had a pretty good start to his season uh, on a bad Arizona team, generating chances, generating goals, uh, even strength scoring, things of that nature. Uh, he's also a, a, an RFA at the end of the year, so he's going to need a new contract. We know the Coyotes are broke, right? So we'll see how that works out. Um, and then the other guy that I would mention, it, but we haven't heard them linked to linked to DeBrus just yet. They have a trade history though, is Boston and Anaheim. Uh, Anaheim has uh, Maxime Comtois, who is a left winger. Uh, he's had a rough start to his year. Uh, rumors of him being on the block earlier in the year. Um, but he's a guy who scored, I think, 16 goals last year. He can play a physical game, but he also gets to the high danger areas of the ice, which is what I think this Bruins team needs more of. Um, so you're, no, but you're absolutely right, though, that like it'd be great if you could replace DeBrusque with DeBrusque because this team – You'll notice this, like they'll have a ton of shots on goal, but they're not there for the second chance looks. They need a guy who can get to that home plate area and bank home some goals because it can't just be Felino. Felino is basically the only guy who can do that. Mm-hmm. So I think you need, I think you need a guy who can do that or a center. I think we're on the right path here. I really do. But, but defense, and you're not going to get a good defenseman for DeBrusque. So I don't really want that right now. I don't think you're going to get a lot of, you know, it's not going to be a one for one trade, really. I think you're going to have to package him for something better. And then it also turns into like, is this team worth investing in? Like, should we just start to pile up those picks? So that's a conversation we can have. Another player I've kind of had my eye on is JT Miller. I know he has another year left. I think he makes a little bit more. I think he's like in the fives, maybe low fives. Um, another year yeah, left right. there in Vancouver, you know, struggling. I mean, I don't know how they fucking haven't fired Jim Benning yet. Like, what does he have on the fucking owner? Like, he's got to have something. It's, it's very weird, right? It's you know, very like, weird, like, because they haven't done anything right except for, like, draft Elias Pettersson. That's, like, the yeah. best thing they've done over there. Like, they got Connor Garland. Yeah, that's great. But they also took on the OEL contract to get him, which is, <laughs> like, eh, it almost makes it not worth it, in my opinion. Uh, Connor Garland, man, he would be a great Bruin, wouldn't he? I know we always joke about, like, Massachusetts players, but how fucking good would Connor Garland be on this team? He's like the he's one of those Massachusetts players that I'm like, yeah, I I, I would like him. I, <laughs> I I like him beyond the fact that he has a six one seven area code. Uh, <laughs> like he seems like a very good player that you would want on your team. He might be seven a one now. I think about it, but anyways, um, <laughs> but I think that like you know J T. Miller would be a great option but he's part of a huge deal, right? Like he would have to be like DeBrusque plus plus, right? right. Like just to make the cap work. Yeah. And, and, and so that's, you know, that I, I feel like a team like Minnesota or New York might outbid you but to get a guy like JT Miller. So I don't know, like, I, I think the Bruins and I have no, I have nothing to base this off of, but I think the Bruins would prefer to just get DeBrusque over and done with and not have to make it part of like, okay, we're going to make our deadline deal now because it involves Jake DeBrusque. Like, I think they, they want to hold over some assets to make a move for a defenseman or a center or whatever they don't get in return for DeBrusque. I think they want to save some capital uh, for that. And then ultimately, yeah, to your point, figure out if it's worth investing more capital in this team, really. Right. Um, especially if you move to Brusque out right now, say it's not for a tra- trade deadline type acquisition. I mean, they're going to have to sign to Grask here. Um, maybe I'd say in a, in a few weeks. So that that's been interesting. Um, I feel like I've kind of had like a little, I feel like I have felt like Rask has been coming back all along. I don't know if you feel the same way, 
but just like the nature of everything going on, like him and the facilities, no one knows, you know, his progress better than anyone than the Bruins. So what do you think about that entire situation? And, and like, obviously it's going to be Swayman going back to the AHL. Just like, do you think this is the right move? Should it come to fruition? Yeah, I think it's the right move. Not because Swayman's been bad necessarily, but I think at this point in his career, you would want him playing every game in the AHL versus every two or three games in the NHL. I just think it makes the most sense to get him the most reps, the most seasoning. And goaltending is a a tricky thing where you can basically bring him up at any point. And it's not like, oh, he's not used to facing shots. Like, no, like goaltenders face shots. Like that's, that's the name of the game. It's not like he has to get used to playing with NHL line mates. He, he just has to get comfortable in in, in a rhythm and net. So I, I think that's the right move. And I think the Bruins have had it all along that, Tuka would be back. They just need to know that if he was going to be capable of coming back. Yeah. I think that when they entered free agency and my timeline may be off here by a week or two, but I want to say he was about two or three weeks removed from surgery and it went well. Right. But you never know. It's a 35 year old goalie with hip surgery. Like something could have happened. So I think a lot of people say, well, why they sign, why they sign all Mark because they didn't know if they had anything in the cupboard. They didn't know if Swayman and Vladar were going to be good because they had promising samples, but again, 10 games and five games. And they needed somebody who could maybe be the backbone of this team to some degree beyond, you know, this upcoming year. So they landed on Linus. So I, I think it's a good idea though. I think a Rask Allmark tandem is, is a, is kind of what they may have had in mind. It had it not been for him needing, needing hip surgery. Right. And Sweeney said as such, So there's been a general understanding that Tuca has to make a decision on his health first and foremost. And when he's able to do that officially and declare himself that this is what he wants to do and play, then we'll find the common ground. We have not hidden from the fact that if indeed he is healthy and wants to play, then he's likely to be a part of our group. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, Like you said, 35 year old goalie coming off hip surgery, obviously you, you have to be confident and comfortable that he's going to look you know, as much like Tuka Rask as he has in the past. So even if it doesn't work out, can you see a scenario in which Swayman comes back up from the AHL? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think that like their schedule is so insane down the stretch that they may need three goaltenders, like, especially if Tuka has wear and tear from conditioning for whatever reason, you know, Allmark is trying to get in a rhythm here, but if he's not up to task, like you may need to make that move and have three goaltenders. And you look at the way the Bruins are positioned right now, roster wise, like, okay, who are you going to, you may have to, you may have to like put someone on waivers or, or whatever. Like, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to hide a guy, but you know, I'm not going to hide someone if they're ready to at the, like to save, you know, no, no offense to him, but like if it's Curtis Lazar, for example, right. Or if it's Anton bleed, let, let's say bleed has a drop off at some point. Like those are, mis- those are calculations you have to make as a team. And, and I think that that's something that Bruins have to be mindful of. So we are officially 25% of the way. What are your surprises? What are your disappointments? Are the Bruins kind of where you expected them to be coming into the season? Do you think maybe they're better than the record, worse than the record shows? I will start off by saying I think Olmark will play better, can play better, and is ultimately better than what we've seen from him. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I, and I think the reason why I agree with that is I look at the teams that Olmark has gotten, with the exception of Detroit. Allmark has faced stiffer competition. I think two games against Florida. Um, I want to say he got, he got the, yeah, he got the Oilers game in the the Maple Leafs game. Like those are, those are good teams he's going against. Right. So I I think that that you have to factor that in when weighing them against one another, where Swayman's got, you know, he's gotten Buffalo, he's gotten uh, uh, Detroit. He's uh, I want to say he's gotten most of the teams that you consider like kind of like not so Philly, you know, he's gotten Philly. Uh, teams you should be exactly, exactly. So I factor that in. I would say this, that I think Bruins fans are, are I, what I love about Bruins fans is that they're the last angry people in the city. I, I, I would mm-hmm. say that everyone else is kind of content and happy now, but they're always angry. This team is not as bad as we think, right? Like if the season ended today, do you, do you think they'd be in the playoffs? Like, Based on point percentage, do you think they'd be in the top eight? Yeah. 
They are. Yes. They, they'd, they be, are. they'd be the top wildcard team, right. which I don't know. It's kind of what I thought was possible given their divisional improvements. Um, so you'll take that, right? So I think this team will get better. Uh, one thing that surprised me actually is Coyle's production as a second line center. It's not David Krejci, but it's not awful either. Like I think he's paced for about 55 points or so, which is the league average for a second line center. And we've been spoiled for years here with David Krejci putting up 70 points, 60 points. Um, I miss that man so much. Uh, he's out dominating what's basically a pro-am league for him <laughs> out in Czech Republic. Uh, he had another goal today, by the way, in case you're wondering. Um, so he, so I think that Cole has been, been good, but watching last night's game really drove it home for me that I want them to get a second line center because I think Halla and Coyle, I think that could be something for you. I really do. I watched them last night. I think that might be a combo that might work. So, uh, and that happens if, if Coyle's on your third line. So I, I'm, I'm all in on this team buying because I think they're already in too deep, but, but I do think they're going to be better than what we've seen so far. Especially with like, you don't know what's going to happen with Patrice Bergeron at the end of this year. I think if they are in a playoff position, I think you do owe it to this team to get them some kind of help. Um, I think everybody, especially Taylor Hall misses David Krejci. You know, it's been two games with Taylor Hall next to Bergeron. Yeah, next to Bergeron and Pasternak, and you're just like, oh yeah, man, like that man is incredibly talented. Maybe we should maybe get someone who's probably better complimented to play with him. So it's, oh, yeah, 100%. it's been interesting. It's been, I wouldn't say I'm disappointed in the team. I think Bruins fans, you know, they just have such high expectations. And it's just like it's they're either like on top of the world or the world is ending. Like there's no in between. And I think you have a team that is in the in-between right now. So it, it's, it's hard to judge in that sense. And they just haven't been playing any fucking games. Like this is the first real week that they, you know, they're playing every other day. You're getting to see this team. I think it starts with building off the win last night against Nashville, who, who you know is a pretty good team. So if they can somehow get, come away with two points against the lightning uh, who just beat the blues last night, I think it'll be huge. Um, but like you said, if you can try and find a second line center and I know they don't grow on trees, but through trade and whatnot, I think this team can go a long way because man, their center depth is, it is pretty brutal. It's pretty brutal, but it was good to see Hall respond. I think, especially after sitting with DeBrusque after that Rangers game, um, cause his game was starting to slip. And I thought he had a, a couple really good games, um, to begin the season. Like if you told me, you know, a month ago, what I felt about Eric Hall, I was really high on him. Like I thought, you know, he was playing pretty well. They had such great chemistry in the preseason that I was like, oh, this is going to be a line to watch out for. And now they're kind of all separated. So Hall is a guy I'm kind of looking at, you know, to, to keep on improving here. I'm wondering if you have any other players like that. Yeah, I think Hall has been, I, I mean, small sample size, obviously, but I, I kind of like him on the wing more than center. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, he can impact the game more with his speed uh, on the wing. Uh, Almost like just, what you want DeBrusque, you know, you wish DeBrusque would do, right? Exactly, that yeah. Speed. So, so I, I, I kind of like that complexion there, honestly. Um, some players that, I, I mean, I think you're seeing Felino what he can do in the power play. I, I think that's something that I didn't really expect, to be honest with you. Um, the comeback in Vancouver, the way he battles in front of the net for those two power play goals, uh, the first, you know, just being part of the pileup that Marshan jumps on and scores. And then on the uh, go-ahead goal from Pasternak, he's tying up a stick there that allows Martian to make that pass over to Pasternak. So uh, you're seeing his value there. I'm curious. I think he can be a better version of Nick Ritchie in that respect. I think he moves a little bit better. I think prep retrieval for him is a little bit better. Um, it's about the back, though. Can the back hold up, right? Like that's something that's that was an issue last year for him. 82 game season now. So it's going to be some wear and tear and naturally, uh, but you brought up the schedule, right? You brought up the lightning. This is a good little run for the Bruins here to, to sort of carve out their identity, win some big games and get some momentum here going after Tampa, they have the Western Canadian swing. So it's Vancouver, Calgary, and Edmonton, some revenge games on the docket for them potentially with, with Edmonton and, and, and Calgary. And then when they come home, uh, I think it's Vegas, Right. And then you have a playoff rematch with the Islanders and then the Canadiens. So there's a good little pocket here of games where the Bruins can a prove themselves, B get emotionally engaged and C, you know, kind of 
find out who they are and what they really need. Yeah. And I think ultimately that's what you're going to see as we continue through those seasons. Like the, my biggest question is like, is this team worth investing into? And I, it's something that remains to be seen and hopefully, you know, they start to get better and start racking up the points. I think, I think they have like four or five games in hand on Detroit, which is kind of crazy. So I don't know, man, it's, it's easy to get down in the dumps about this team. I found it easier, you know, this year more than ever, especially with the loss of David Krejci um, to be like, fuck, like, man, like, <laughs> like the good times coming to an end. And I don't like that. Yeah, I mean, it's it, and naturally, it's always easier to shit on things than than support them. That's just it. It's, it requires way less effort and energy, <laughs> and, and so I think we all kind of default to that because we're all uh, living in hell still. So um, it's just easier to be like that. <laughs> but I, but no, I, I I I agree that like it's it's easy to get down on this team. But but I do think that so long as Bergeron and Marshan and Pasternak are are doing their thing, and so long as you have Charlie McAvoy playing this way you really should be a buy kind of team. Like you really should want this team to make the improvements because the future, the, the future is going to suck. It re- it really is. You got to embrace that and just try to live for the present. I think yeah. that applies to the front office as well saying, we know that the dark days are going to be coming and they're going to be dark. So let's try to maximize what we can right now. So I'm all in on team get Bergeron a cup before he retires. I think anyone who cares about this team and cares about, you know, what he's done for the organization should be the same. Totally. Absolutely. And you touched on Charlie McAvoy and just what he's done this season has been pretty remarkable. I know Mac Rizlik, uh hasn't scored a goal yet, but I feel like that's coming from him. I think the defense were, was really bad early on in the season and they're starting to tighten up. I know Zaboral going down kind of sucks, but we'll, we'll see what tomorrow has in store. I think it's a measuring stick game um, against a really good lightning team. Who's, you know, they're they're That's who you're chasing. Like, they're third in the Atlantic. That's who you're chasing to get a big two points against them and stop them from getting any points, I think will be big. So uh, it's been an interesting year to say the least. I miss Dave Krejci so much. I hope he comes back. Um, I know there was like, I know this is like the last or no next week is maybe the last week that they have to sign him before he has to go through waivers. But I'm still like, if you sign David Krejci and he tells everyone else that, you know, if you, if you pick me up in waivers, I'm not coming. I still think that works like for a league that no one offer sheets, anybody else. Like, don't you think that that's a viable reason? Uh, Ethical? No, but I think it, it could happen, but it's happened before. Like that's different though, than what's happened. I want to say it was Nabokov. Uh, got signed by Detroit and had to but be put on waivers. Playing? But then he played, and then he he, oh, he said did. he said I'm not going to report if you claim me, and then he ultimately reported the Islanders. Like so, and I don't think Creature would do so that per se. Ago. But but teams are willing to take that chance and block it, block a player from going to their team. And I mean, maybe it won't happen because it all depends who's chasing the Bruins at that point and That's what true. their situation is cap wise or or you know whatever it may be, but. You know, I don't know if you're if you're a team like uh, I don't know. Let's say you're Columbus or New Jersey, right? And you think that you're like, oh, we are as good or potentially as good as Boston. Why wouldn't you make that claim just to block them, right? Like it does help you because you're already working from behind the eight ball. Right? Why would you want to let him go two more spots to Boston or whatever it would be in the standings? I'm just saying, crazier things have happened. I just I just trying to keep. You know, as much as we've talked about getting like a, a second line center, I'm like, you know what? Maybe Craig's coming back. I know. <laughs> I, 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 I'm with you. Back. Like, I, I, I want to believe. I just think that I think that everything is working against it. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I just I just don't see it. Unfortunately, I think I see it more likely next year, especially if Bergeron leaves. I think if Bergeron were to retire, Craig should be like. Hey, that spot between Bergeron, I mean, between uh, Martian and Pasternak, yeah, I'll be taking that. Thank you. Because <laughs> I think he I think he loved his time there uh, playing between those two players because who the hell wouldn't? You also so have to I, account, I, I think... like, we have to account for the Olympics, is, which is pretty crazy. And, like, you pray for health after that. I know Bergeron and Martian will be going, Pasternak will be going. So that that's kind of an interesting conversation, too, we could have. Do you think that the NHL is going to go to the Olympics? I'm curious your thoughts on that. I am 75, 25. Yes. Right now, if this COVID situation gets worse, uh, I will no longer be confident. 
I got a feeling they're not going. We should probably. I, I mean, I have nothing to back. The- I have nothing to back that up. I just think that with the, with the, the 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 COVID outbreaks, the the variant, the the fact that if a player tests positive, he may have to stay behind. Right. You know, for another few weeks. I don't know if owners are going to want to deal with that because yeah. their best players are going to be the ones going. I mean, especially after seeing those USA jerseys that are so fucking ugly. And I'm just like, who designed me? Who who are designing these NHL jerseys? I know I support the Pooh Bear, which is like ugly in itself. But between the Predator Stadium Series jersey, um, what else? The USA Olympic jerseys, the New Jersey Devils third jerseys. Who Who is designing these fucking jerseys? I don't know, man. I, I Why couldn't you just make like a, why couldn't you do the inverted version of like, the winter classic jersey that Nashville had because that jersey is awesome. Yeah, I love that jersey. I wish you could do that. I wish the Lightning would do would would do something like that pays homage to their older logo, the one that they won the first cup with. Because I do like that logo with like the like I believe it's the the state of Florida like within. I, I want to say I can't. I it might be a little bit off here, but I did like that logo a lot. Um, don't I just, think, I don't know. Don't you think that like you should have fans design a Jersey and then vote on a Jersey or even if the fans don't design it, someone designs it. You give me five options and put it to a vote. I think the majority mm-hmm. of people would pick the correct Jersey. The stupidest thing the NHL has done in the last, whatever, six months, I know it's a short window uh, is get rid of the reverse retros. Why wouldn't you bring those back? Why are those on the They're coming back next year. Like, are they are that they what they're the saying? Show? Yeah, I think that they're coming back next year with either a new one or the old ones. Um, that's why I've been pushing like the Pooh Bear because I've heard like uh, it's like in the running or whatever. I think it ultimately it'll be a completely different jersey. I've heard a white jersey. Um, but like what you just like, I understand all of these things like are for money, but like we've seen the Bruins alternate jerseys 800 times already. And we're mm-hmm. only 25% into the season. They're, pl- they're wearing them. I think three or four more times the rest of December. And I'm just like, why? You I know do why not, I don't want to see that Jersey anymore. You know why? why? Tra- c- come on. Christmas sales. They got to get them. They but if you had a completely new Jersey every year, Christmas sales. Yeah. I do wish the NHL would take on more of that NBA approach where right. like teams just have nine jerseys. It's like, just all right, they can wear whichever one they jerseys. want. Jerseys. Why can't like they play 82 games a season? Why can't there be 10 games where they wear special jerseys? You know that half the half the reverse retro jerseys that were made are better than than that They're team's actual, current jersey. Yeah. I don't the know why current they like, Nashville Predators jersey is ugly. Yes. I yes. don't know what their I don't know what the reverse retro jersey is. It the old logo with like a saber tooth, like the gray one. It, yeah, it's a saber tooth. Yeah. That one's kind of gross. That one's kind of nasty. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but like the Panthers, for example, that blue. Oh, that is a beautiful. That is a beautiful jersey. And like there was only a few teams that I thought had really ugly reverse retros, like the Capitals one. Oh my god, that's that's. Oh, yeah, that I love cool. that. I'm a I'm a huge fan of that. You like uh, the, that one. The oh the eagle the oh I love eagle? the eagle I love the eagle the I'm only the only way they could one. up the eagle for me would be if they did the like the the uh, capital logo where it's like the yeah, yeah it's yeah, the yeah. actual physical capital right. I, I like I like that one um yeah I don't know I I I ultimately I want the Bruins to go back to you like Pooh Bear I like Meth Bear I like Meth Bear more than Pooh Bear I would be fine with that if it's for you know a game right like do mm-hmm. one game this like do it in different you know different eras and whatnot i think that would be awesome then you can bring some of the guys back have them drop the puck this is free marketing right now nhl like what drives vegas me needs to make a jersey and then because you guys will jump all over this vegas needs to make a jersey that's just viva on it <laughs> that would be sick just like rangers think, or font, even like- just like the vegas like you know and like the actual vegas logo with like the lights and whatnot yeah like, that would be that work too I mean, there's a lot of things they can, a lot of things these teams can do. They're not, they're not calling us. They have to call us. We'll help them. And like, like, I love when teams do like Marvel nights, like Mm -hmm. ECHL where they have like the Thanos glove and like that, like that shit's so cool. Like you're going to make money that way too. Like why not do, and, and it's a matter of time before you get the ads on the Jersey, right? Like, I think that's coming in the next few years. So I think they would make so much money doing a couple of jerseys every year, like. 
Oh yeah. No, there's room for creativity. And I think you're seeing the NHL uh, teams and players are getting out of the stuffier kind of hockey culture that used to Although, didn't, permeate. <laughs> didn't the Leafs start with like no dress code and then someone ruined it and they went back to the dress code? Yeah. Somebody, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know whose outfit it was, but somebody probably came in like barefoot <laughs> and they were like, come, come on, man, you gotta wear shoes. <laughs> like, doing, yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I, don't, I think the Coyotes still don't have, still don't have a dress code. So they're, they're allowing some flavor. It's just, it's just getting the league itself now to support this flavor and get some, get some fun jerseys up in here. Right. Gotta do it. Be more like the NBA. Let players' personalities come up. I know it's such like a, an old boys' club, but it's just like, come on, man. Yeah. Now there's room. There's room for. You don't have to, you know, make the make the jersey like a disco ball, but you can have some fun with it. Like sports are fun. A lot of people forget this. Sports are fun. <laughs> that's gonna be the that's gonna be the promo clip for this podcast. <laughs> sports are fun. I, I just, love a lot of people. A lot of people don't realize that it's supposed to be enjoyable. <laughs> you, you you wouldn't know it but but that's how it is <laughs> all right that was ty anderson with the state of the bruins state of the boston bruins ty where can people find you uh in hell no um, i am on i am on twitter at i at underscore ty anderson s-o-n of course uh and then uh 95sportsup.com it's where you can find all my articles uh, do a podcast with Matt Dolph as well, night of the uh, Sports Hub Underground. So uh, we do new episodes every Thursday that come out. So uh, yeah, catch me there. And you guys talk about more than just like sports on it, right? You do pop culture and all that good stuff. Yeah, we do some pop culture. Uh, we do some football as well because Matt, that's kind of you know I'm on the Bruins beat and and Matt is mainly on the Patriots beat. We'll 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 flip flop. You know, there's only three three people on the staff, so we kind of have to do everything. Uh, but those are kind of our areas of expertise. So uh, a little bit of everything, you know, it, it's, but that's kind of by design. We don't want it to be just hockey or just uh, football. That's why it has the name it does, you know, so we can do whatever we want, whatever we want with it. So go yell at Ty and tell him how good Crazy Train is on Twitter. Don't Thanks. do that. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Marina's Morning Skate. Hopefully we'll be back soon.